Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is your man, DJ Caveman. We're back again for another episode of Inside the Mind of, uh, where we talk to different uh, different folks, uh, specifically men, about their careers and, you know, the way that mental health plays a role in that career. It's uh, it's November. It's a uh, men's health month. Um, you know, I haven't shaved in a couple of years, so I, you know, it's very easy for me not to shave because if I shave this off, I'm going to look like Cleveland from the Cleveland show, so I got to going to keep my beard. But today on the show, we have a very special guest, um, another multi-hyphenate uh, icon in the, in the state, if you will. Um, you know, we'll get into all, all the hyphens, but today's guest is the comparable Ed Brady on the show. And you have a lot of, you're an entrepreneur, uh, your dad, your business owner. Um, you were at one time a councilman. Um, are you still, are you still part of the city council? No, I uh, I had to resign the council with the ethics commission because uh, I wanted to save our community theater at the time. It was 97 years old. That was their ruling. Uh, certainly uh, enjoyed my time on the council. I did two and a half terms, but uh, the theater's still alive against all odds uh, going into its 100th year and uh, we're winning our daily battles. So uh, certainly was uh, worth the move or the shift. Uh, still to do community good, but I, I loved my time on the council. Like I said, I served two and a half terms and uh, learned a lot about government and and then uh, trying to bring people together and make a change. And who knows what the world will bring me back in, into in the future. But uh, yeah, right now it's just kind of about trying to make a social impact every day with my time. That's what's up. We we definitely uh, I see the work. Um, you know, if you follow if you follow Ed on uh, on the social medias, you see the work he's done for for the city he grew up in. Everybody should. Uh, to take a page out of your book when it comes to the, the philanthropic work you do with the schools and the and just the community in general. But um, let's um, let's get right into it, man. Let's let's uh, take a second and kind of let the people know who you are and uh, what you do. And uh, yeah. of course, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, like you uh, alluded to earlier in the introduction, uh, I grew up in Cranston. That's my hometown. Uh, I, you know, my I was born in. Smith Hill, Silver Lake, that's where my father grew up. And uh, my dad was a, a gunshot victim uh, at 17. The bullet wasn't meant for him and it kind of rerouted his whole life and uh, eventually met my mother. And uh, when they got pregnant for me, they, uh, you know, my mom went back to school because my dad wasn't working. And uh, eventually they got us to Cranston. And uh, Nana grew up in uh, Silver Lake and I would go back every Sunday before she passed and we would do Sunday supper there. So. You know, I still uh, I still love Dora Street and my memories there. But for the most part, uh, you know, I've been in Cranston since I was two years old and I moved out to Hollywood after I graduated college. I went to school uh, at Bryant University and I studied film and television. That was a school that I never thought I could get into or uh, I'd be able to afford. But because I played hockey and, uh, you know, I, God uh, found a way to help me get in there. And then after I graduated, I moved out to L.A. and uh tried to pursue a career in film, film and television, but my mom got sick and it brought me home and she's still alive today. So I'm glad I made that, that shift home. And uh, for the last, let's see, that was, I came home in 2008 and obviously it's 2024. So since then it's just the entrepreneurial grind. I started as a, a nightclub promoter. If uh, my memory serves me right, Daryl, that's kind of when we met back then, uh, you know, over a decade ago, I was uh, promoting a lot of spots from 2008 to 2012. And my time in Hollywood, I had met a lot of celebrities. So I was fortunate enough to bring them all back to Rhode Island. And we really hit Rhode Island by storm in those years. And it, it led to an investor wanting to open up my own spot. And we opened up a restaurant and then another restaurant. And, uh, fortunately, today, after some successes and failures in that world and different economic climates, we still have four within one brand, which is called the Thirsty Beaver. Uh, their locations are in Cranston, Smithfield, Westerly, and North Kingston. Uh, additionally, we're still the owners of the building at the Historic Park Theater, which is about to celebrate its uh, 100th year. So those are kind of my entrepreneurial pursuits currently regarding hospitality. In addition to that, uh, I've been very fortunate over the last two years since COVID to get back into the young dreamer. I mean, that young kid that moved out to Hollywood is now uh, fortunate enough to be helping recruit films like Good Burger 2 here to the state that he loves. And in addition to that, just wrapped a film with a high school friend and an incredible director and team with Brody Productions and Tommy DiNucci. Uh, we just wrapped a film called The Roaring Game. 
Um, in addition to that, I, I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards, specifically one that we founded in honor of our friend who we lost uh, over COVID to depression and mental health and, and addiction. And he was a sergeant in the military. Uh, his name was Adam DeSisio. You might recall him from earlier in the day. He was a protector at a lot of our security and a lot of our events. And uh, now we try to just uh, do community good and make social impact in the city of Cranston, adopting parks, giving out turkeys, giving out Christmas presents. Uh, at this point, um, when I define who I am, it's not necessarily by profession or what I do for a job. It's really the internal self-work that I'm doing day by day to be the best father I can be to our two-year-old son, Maverick, and the best husband I can be to my loving and caring wife who supports me through all these entrepreneurial journeys, uh, Taylor. And uh, am I doing the work to just uh, be a good soul? You know, and uh, that's kind of who Ed Brady is today at 40 years old. And, um, you know, I obviously, like everyone else, have to make a living and, and put food on the table. But I'm just like everyone else trying to follow my dreams and, and live day by day and do the best I can. Nice. Um, so let's get in. Let's get into, um, you know, the transition from from acting to like club promoting. You know, it's it's. There's a lot of parallels, um, as we know. Entertainment is entertainment is entertainment. If you're if you're an entertainer, uh, but as an entrepreneur, uh, what do you feel like is the like the most stressful part of aside from the aside from the like money and having to maybe pay back investors and things like that, but from the from the day to day operations um, as an entrepreneur, uh, say you know you what what's like your your largest stressor that you would identify yeah cash flow uh cash flow in a down market I, you know i recently read a great book called uh, true measure of a man and, uh, basically it talks about these down markets every 10 years and how a lot of men particularly you know they view their success on what kind of car they drive or what kind of house they have or what kind of materialistic possessions they've been able to you know gain throughout their journey of life and within that book, it really depicts how suicide and, and, you know, mental health in men specifically, you know, eight out of 10 suicides are in men. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I try not to, I've had great years financially where, you know, I've, I've had more money in the bank than an, a kid could have ever dreamed of. And I've had years that, you know, I've been negative in entrepreneurial pursuits. And, and what I try now is just to kind of, live my life uh, consistently and, and, and stay here. And like I said earlier, uh, and um, be the best version of myself and, and not kind of quantify success on how I'm doing basically entrepreneurially or at a job or in life and, you know, what I'm doing to make myself better every day. Word. Um, when it, when it comes down to it though, what, what are your summer, like, in a stressful day, like, is there like a go-to, um, like, cause we, this is, you know, like from a, from a mental health perspective, like, are you, are you meditating? Are you, are you done to like, are you doing counseling? Are you doing? Uh, yeah. Great, great question. Um, you know, we, we touched on cash flow being the most difficult part of business because I was too young to realize when I was out in LA, the rippling effects of 2008 and the mortgage crisis or nine 11, which I was still a kid. But I certainly understand the effects of COVID and the every small business is currently as I watch major chains, restaurants close, massive amounts of stores, people lose jobs. The, the stress that goes into a lot of our ideas or a lot of our time or money that we're investing in are making community good. You know, they're not just restaurants that we're opening. One of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that we've raised millions of dollars for nonprofits and community initiatives at our restaurants through Trivia for a Cause or different type of fundraising efforts. So, you know, what am I doing every day knowing that the true measure of my soul isn't quantified by materialistic gain or how many restaurants I can get, but more so the amount of souls I can touch, the amount of people I can listen to, the amount of people I can uplift. The, the type of energy that I can give out when I'm receiving, uh, obviously, good energy, too. I think a lot of it, Daryl, has been internal self-work, right? Dealing with trauma of childhood, de dealing with different molds that we had. Uh, we're all molded differently. We're all grown up in different households and different teachers. We all have different life experiences that can negatively affect the mindset. So, obviously, 
diving deep to that trauma, tackling those traumas, you know, making sure that I'm not letting fear overcome overcome me and I'm, I'm leading with love. And at some point in the process, I had to identify that I was a leader. You know, I wasn't, this is not something that you go to school for and you think that, uh, you know, I want to be a leader one day. I want to, I want to be the mayor or, or I want to be the, the governor. Or I want to, I want to produce on sets. It's, it's kind of, you just learn every day and you find yourself in these situations where opportunities keep coming to you. And obviously you have to walk in God's path. So, you know, he spoke on a question of what am I doing? Well, you know, I'm certainly connected more than ever uh, with my faith, with Christianity, with God. Uh, I'm, additionally, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly trying to read 10 pages uh, of a book a day and learn. I'm, I'm on this new uh, 75 semi-hard. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're walking. Uh, meditation is certainly in our uh, rotation. Additionally, uh, I, I channel Reiki. It's been a energy healing experience with me with a Reiki master that helps me kind of unblock thoughts. And, um, you know, obviously all of it comes into play when leading at a high level or just just trying to be the best version of yourself. Uh, if, if you if you can't fix something financially or if you can't fix something that's out of your control at that exact moment, well, what can you fix? You can be doing the self-investment in your mind. You can be doing the self-investment in your body. You can be walking and then kind of changing those routines daily and getting back into a different energy space in your head allows you to refocus and unblock a negative thought into a positive thought. You know, I think I'm always have always been a, a glass half full, not a glass half empty guy. So I'll always see the positive in even any potential negative situation. But like everybody else, the world has a way of throwing things at us that test us and make us go dark. And we're always going to be fighting good versus evil. And, you know, good has to keep winning. And we have to find a way for our character and our soul to keep doing the right things, even when we find ourselves in situations uh, we don't expect to be in, right? Those are the true tests. So uh, still doing that self-work. I think I'll be doing that self-work, Daryl, every day for the rest of my life, right? Because we're ever right. evolving, we're ever trying to improve. And, and uh, you know, if I, if I want to continue to make the social impact that I believe I can over time, then uh, I got to keep doing the work. Absolutely. And that's a fantastic answer. I'm glad you touched on it because um, like we say, you, or like I tell people all the time, like it's not always about the money. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that like a lot of us have that, that stigma uh, because we see the, the haves versus the have nots. And some of us are in the middle and some of us are, you know, sometimes the haves. <laughs> and then, we can quickly become the have nots, um, sure. you know? And so we have to always maintain like the, as long as you're good inside, you know, everything else kind of falls into place. I like to tell people that everything happens the way it's supposed to, yeah. um, which sometimes isn't the way you want it to be, but sometimes you gotta, you know, take 295 to get to 95, as they say, you know? Amen. Um, Amen. And if I could elaborate on that, Daryl, you know, when I was younger, uh, you know, I touched on living in uh, Silver Lake and, and, you know, three family apartment is where I was born. so. You know, my mom was doing the overnights at work. Dad wasn't working. So we didn't grow up. You know, I grew up in a nice area in Cranston, but by far we were the not in the wealthy neighborhood. And, you know, I always knew that the only way I could change my family's situation early on was hard work and networking. So, I mean, for me, it's it's always, you know, at one point in that process, when I saw when I was caddying, when I saw, uh, you know, all sorts of nice cars going into the country club or, you know, I thought that was the answer. You know, I thought, you know, I needed to be the best version of myself to be the most confident version of myself. I needed the nice car. I needed the nice house, you know, and my family would be happy if we had those nice things. And then as life goes on and you have money in the bank and, you know, you are living in a house that you could only have dreamed of or whatever it may be. And you're still not internally happy with yourself because you haven't done that self-work to tackle those things, those insecurities, the trauma, whatever it may be that bothers us about ourselves. Then you know, we kind of reshift how we perceive life. And for now, it's like, of course, I want, I think as a new father, like every father, um, I just want to make a better life for my son. And the only way to do that is to keep doing the self-work and to be a man of good character and to be impeccable to my word and to not make assumptions that even those people with the nice guys have it good. Well, they've worked hard or they've had to go through internal struggle or battles of the mind to get those nice things, you know, uh, inherited wealth. I might have been jealous of when I was earlier in my experience, but so many different investors have to, had to invest not only time in me, but money in my development to allow any opportunity 
that I've had to uh, succeed. So, you know, I've always been a rise with the village kind of guy as I've grown older, uh, try to share the knowledge that I've gained and a lot of it even through failure. If I can give a young college kid a thought that they're not thinking about before, and then they can save themselves making that same mistake I did, uh, that's that's a lot why I like going on these college tours and going back to Bryant and giving keynote speeches and, and talking at my high school or whatever it may be, or even just having a podcast there. It's because, uh, you know, always hearing someone else's different side of the perspective and even being not afraid to change yours. You know, I think we need more and more community conversations like this of people from all different walks of life to kind of remold society. Because, you know, as much as I think uh, growing up like I did and, and seeing, uh, you know, segregation and seeing uh, people that were in cliques and villages, you know, more than ever, I see kind of society, at least here in Rhode Island, coming together and, you know, everyone kind of vibing. But on a national level, we see 1% difference in elections, right? And that's kind of by design. I've even learned in government the data that they use to try to make people believe all these different things when the reality is I go into every situation meeting anybody with a clean slate and I just want to kind of get to know and listen who they are and then give a little bit about mine. And, and in doing so, I think has been the only reason I've been able to scale in life and grow businesses and grow friendships and grow networks because it's not always been uh, transactional. It hasn't been for money. You know, it's been, right. how can I help this person? How can they help me down the line? Well, if it comes back, great. But it helps me helping others. You know, I'm living a life of, of service. I'm living a life of, of positive good, at least in my mind. And, uh, you know, I don't really care at this point in my process. I did when I was younger, when I was in high school. You know, we always care about what people think. But I'm at a point now where I know who I am. I know who my soul is i know who my heart is and of course like everyone else i'm imperfect and i have work to do but uh, as long as i'm happy with myself i can be happy with others right um you're a new dad um uh, and uh he has the best name in the business um thank you brother uh but, you know shout out to your to your lovely wife for allowing you to you know Give him, give him the name of Maverick. Did you? Was that a was that a hard discussion to have, or was she pretty easy about? Uh, you know, we were we were throwing I'm names, the board and uh, you know, Edward was out. I was I was that was on my top list, and uh, you know, I, I was able to sneak that in uh, for the middle name, and I'm thankful she allowed me to do that. But <laughs> you know, Top Gun was a great movie. Uh, many people ask, you know, what the inspiration behind the name was. Um, you know, it's a strong name. It's a bold name, and uh, you know, I think uh, you, you know, men, women. Uh, you, you have to be soft and you have to be a good listener, but you got to be strong in this current world. And there was a, I, you know, many don't know this about me, but I, I played a professional poker for a living uh, really, really earlier in my process when I was living in LA and I was winning some tournaments. And there was a poker movie with Mel Gibson where he was on a ship. And uh, that was the name of the movie. It was called Maverick. I remember that. And movie, I always yeah. liked uh, the underdogness. Well, not only of that movie, but I, I'm a big fan of underdogs and movies in general. And uh, yeah, I, it just kind of stuck. And uh, Maverick is truly a maverick. He's got a really light energy, light soul. He's a, he's a great human, uh, brings joy to us every day. My, and, and my wife, Taylor, is, is, a, is an incredible mom, uh, watching the amount of effort that she puts in day to day to mold that soul. And uh, it, it's just a profound new respect for the amount of effort that mothers in general uh, place on molding of children. And, uh, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, appreciate all the work my mom did growing up. And uh, it gives a new perspective when you become a parent of viewing the struggles that your parents had to navigate through um, to give you opportunity to succeed. And uh, yeah, that's Absolutely. kind of that. Um, but so talk to me a little bit about the, the transition, right? You're your 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 Ed Brady, the club promoter, the business owner, the restaurateur, um, you know, living the the singular lifestyle, only really having to worry about yourself as an entrepreneur, to now sure. having to, you know, maintain a family sure. as an entrepreneur. Like, what is that like um, for you? And like, how are you how are you coping with that so far? Like, it's a huge transition, you know, sure. from you know, you single Ed only has to worry about Ed. If it's okay if I only got one plate and one fork, um, you know, I'm alive, you know. And, yeah. and now you have like people that are relying on you 
in a in an industry that you know is pretty volatile from time to time. Sure. Um, you know, sure. how does that work for you? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's it's profound. It's actually a profound question. Um, you know, I don't. For for me, it it was certainly been people that I've enjoyed time with and you know loved in the process of life. Uh, but there's never been a love uh, like my wife, and uh, she's my best friend. Uh, she was my best friend for a couple of years prior to our first kiss. So I got to know her organically. She knew who I was. She knew my ambitions. She knew my dreams. She knew my goals. Uh, didn't judge them. Uh, only through that friendship. And, uh, you know, after that first kiss happened, uh, at the time, uh, she was a waitress at the Thirsty Beaver. And, uh, you know, I'm owning the location. And I, I remember uh, she kissed me, which I was very uh, gracious and, and thankful for. But I just remember saying to her, uh, well, if this is going to go anywhere, you know, you can't work here anymore. And, uh, my friend at District, Jen, who I used to promote for, uh, hired her like the next day. And uh, yeah, a year later, we, I proposed. And, uh, you know, it's it's been a lot of great communication. And I think that's, for me, the core of, of any relationship, whether it's business or love or life or friendship, um, empathetically just listening is is kind of like everything. And uh, you, you spoke on some major thoughts that are stresses of men, right? You know, a, lot, a lot of that book I spoke on earlier, True Measure of Man, is, uh, you know, the, the pressures we put on ourselves as men to provide, you know, we're in a, a society where both partners, uh, you know, have to work towards a sustainable living in the current climate of the economy. And, uh, you know, she does that, she, she takes, great pride in, uh, you know, knitting uh, these custom letter sweaters. And I love the joy that they they bring her. And I've watched her evolve from uh, doing here to then working in daycare to then selling real estate to uh, now seeing her eight years younger than me kind of explore all her entrepreneurial ideas and, and, and what paths she wants to take in a career ahead. And I think for me, um, it's only complimented and made me want to uh, excel further because of the love that she shares to me and, and the understanding. And she's there just like any other ideal partner would be through thick and thin. And we've had uh, a difficult journey post COVID. I remember two months after COVID happened and, you know, we're in the restaurants and there's plexiglass and, you know, we can right. be able to take out and, and I have, um, everything's on the line, right? There's no backup plan. You can't have a backup plan in entrepreneurship. And, uh, you know, I can't remember at one point in the process, her telling me to give up or, uh, that it wasn't possible or, or whatever it may be. So, uh, you know, those, those stresses continue to be real, but I think, uh, as long as you're talking through it, um, uh, as long as you're communicating with empathy, as long as you're listening, I think, uh, you know, you can navigate through anything as long as the love is still there. And uh, for, for me, I'm very fortunate it is. And for Maverick, uh, you know, you kind of re-identify everything that we were speaking on earlier, that a dollar fifty balloon makes him happy. You know, just spending time with him reading makes him happy. Just giving him attention while playing makes him happy. So. You know, of course, I want him to be able to get a great education, and I'm hoping that's uh, just like I did in Cranston Public Schools. And uh, of course, I want him to experience life at the fullest and and live uh, a great life. So I'm going to continue to work hard. And but I also know, uh, you know, it's God's plan. You know, uh, if we have food on the table, if we have clothes, if we have shelter, if we have family and a support system around us. Those are the greatest things that that we can have. I was, uh, you know, I don't mean to go on on this answer, on this question, but I remember I was I was talking to a pastor. We were at a 25 year anniversary of uh, Pastor Pangburn last night at Praise Tabernacle Church. They do great work right here in Cranston at the Rhode Island Dream Center. They have a night a truck that goes out and feeds the homeless. And um, one of my first girlfriends was his daughter, and I was 16 years old, and I didn't know much about. Uh, faith in God. And, you know, I wasn't really happy with the, uh, the church I was going to at the time. And uh, this family kind of brought me into their house and in and, and, and the world of God. And to see and just kind of a lot of those memories are coming back today because it, it's fresh in my mind. But uh, when we leave this 
this planet, when we leave this life experience, right? Like we can't take anything with us, right? The only thing that we're going to be able to leave is a lasting legacy of the souls that we touched, you know, and uh, to see what they've accomplished 25 years from when I first met them as that young 16 year old and they were in this small church with no parking. And now they own the church all, all right that's in Cranston. That's, that's, you know, they paid off a million dollar note over 10 years and they've done massive, massive rippling good. And hundreds of people go to service at nine and 11. And that's because they're living their life on souls and making a positive impact. And they're not thinking about materialistic things that they, you know, that's not what makes them happy. What makes them happy is creating positive good. And, uh, you know, I think through life experience, I I don't take it for granted that that family was brought into my life at 16 and I'm still looking to them for mentorship at 25 years later at 40. We need to be able to go to people, Daryl, you know, I know we touched on this earlier, everywhere and be vulnerable and understand that they're not judging us. And we have to be able to go to people that are smarter than us constantly and live life more than us. And listen and 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 kind of that's what gives us the energy to find a new solution or think outside the box or keep driving forward in business and in life and in family and and through internal struggle Um, so yeah i hope that answered your question yeah yeah, uh, absolutely um i do want to get into into your your community work as well um but before we do that uh, talk about um like your mentors coming up um, mm-hmm. and, and kind of how, how like I mean, in, especially in the in the entrepreneurial businesses and in, in restaurants, like are there guy are there did you go to like the the top guys or did you guys was it like just a group of friends like on the LeBron thing where they just kind of became their own mentors? Um, but the importance of having you know somebody to bounce ideas off of, and sometimes you know we think we have an idea, but we or it can never work because. You know, I don't have this or I don't have that or I don't really know what to do over here. So, you know, I think that mentors are important Um, and it doesn't have to always be for me, at least. It's not always um, like an official mentor. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it's just, you know, I'll watch a guy from a distance and then, you know, occasionally I get a chance to ask a couple questions. Um, But who are those people for you and, you know, how do they help you kind of get to uh, that's, that's a great question, uh, you know, and, and I think because I've been fortunate enough to have so many great people impact my life. I just spoke on, you know, the Payne family. Um, they helped with faith, right? They helped with God. Uh, you know, one of the first memories that I can go back to was a gentleman by the name of Steve Mara. And uh, he, they, at, at his point, uh, he at his pinnacle, I think he had eight or nine restaurants and I was a promoter at a a place called uh, View at Water Place. And it was probably in the years 2009 to 2012, three years running with my partner, Jess Simone, um, the hottest spot in Providence, in, at least in those years. And we were doing 800, 900 people a night and even defying our own logic, even defining defying our own odds. And it, it certainly wasn't just uh, myself or her or, or Steve or, or Brandon, it was the team that we were able to cultivate. It was the leadership style that he had of love and listening that I certainly try to emulate today. And, um, you know, I lost him. I lost him to suicide. And uh, that was one of the first major losses that I remember feigning and not understanding and going to my best friend who was my mother and, and, you know, having deep conversations about that. And then that led to uh, another mentor, uh, which was Jeff Quinlan, who who is now uh, my partner in the Thirsty Beaver Brands. And I had met him caddying on a on a, on a bench at 13 years old. We were kids, and he went off and went to law school, and he was flipping real estate, and he was doing a lot in the uh, residential and commercial world, and saw something in me, and I put together a basic business plan. And uh, eventually, after Steve's passing, it led to our first place and I was able to pay him back uh, within a year, which was unprecedented, which led to the Thirsty Beaver. Um, And one of the greatest strengths that that Jeff has and qualities that Jeff has that I still learn from today is his resilience, his outside the box thinking, 
Um, he was so versed in so many areas that were not my strengths. And I know what my strengths are at this point in my process and what my weaknesses are. He coached me through uh, a very empathetic approach, but an approach of, but you still have to get this done. And it's, it held me accountable for many, many years, which led to other mentors like Ernie Almonte, who I just uh, celebrated winning man of the year. And, uh, you know, he comes to mind because I met him at Bryant and he's opened up a lot of doors for me. And, and you know, the list, I could, I could go on for a half an hour on the amount of people that have made an impact on my growth uh, recently, as recently as the Verde family. Uh, they've, they've, they've been doing film here at a very, very high level in Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, coming off the Good Burger set, I was yearning for my next opportunity and, and, and Tommy uh, brought me into that family uh, who I believe Tommy's uh, one of the best directors in the country. I've been fortunate enough to be on sets throughout the, throughout the country and in LA and, and we don't even uh, it, it's, it's amazing uh, the work that he's doing, but uh, you know, just be able to, to sit back and observe, like you said earlier, uh, you don't necessarily have to even ask questions. You can learn obviously in the environment, and uh, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not grounded at this point in my process in each moment, uh, thankful for the lessons that I'm receiving, the knowledge that I'm, uh, you know, obviously taking in because I think it's all meant for whatever's next on our journey. And, uh, you know, what, one thing that I'm, I'm very uh, appreciative of is I'm spending my time. I think when we get older, we don't want to waste time, you know, especially right. as we see friends and and loved ones pass and we realize the true meaning. I know we spoke earlier on, we can't take anything with, with us when we pass, you know, we're, we're only going to be able to bring with us those, those lives that we touched. Um, now I'm spending my time with intention. You know, it's okay to say no, if it's something that you don't believe is adding value to your life or, or bringing you in the right direction. And I think life has a interesting way of kind of, diverting us and making us go off on all these paths. I never dreamed of being a nightclub promoter. You know, I never dreamed of opening restaurants. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, but opportunities came and uh, I was able to provide value in those situations through just being a good person, you know, or trying to be a good person, trying to be the best person that I could be and, and building teams and leading the right way and learning from other leaders and mentors and, and, and empathetic styles. My, my approach of leadership is never going to change. I'm always going to be who I am. As soon as I become unauthentic in the process, uh, not honest with who I am, I, I, you lose buy-in with your teams. And I'm able to grow up a, a caddy with Jeff and be able to open up all these restaurants and save community theaters and um, do all these, you know, produce movies or whatever it may be. If it's all about the teams. We're only one part of the team. You can't treat the person at the top any different than the person at the bottom, right? Because ultimately we're all creating and, and, and buying into the same vision, whether it's a movie or a restaurant. You know, I, I, when we would open up a restaurant, I would enjoy putting headphones on and going to the dish pit, not even telling the new team who I was and just kind of listen to how they interacted. And then obviously I'll work with my managers on changing or adapting where they need to be or locations or um, mentorship is everything, you know, I, that, that was the core of the question. So I want to wrap it back up with, uh, and I enjoy more than ever uh, taking on interns and going to, like I said, going to, going to classes now and classrooms and speaking and, and mentoring myself because uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the amount of time that was sent, spent on improving my soul, improving my education, giving me opportunity to succeed. And I want to be able to provide that in my future to others. Very cool. Ed, man, you do a lot of great work in the community. Um, you know, I've seen some of it firsthand. And, um, you know, tomorrow's the election, so I'd be remiss if I didn't at least touch on your political career. Um, how what kind of uh what kind of decision was that for you aside from like obviously you want to do the good in the world but uh you know politicians have uh they get a lot of them get a bad rep um you know it was being like a uh, snake oil salesman and you know not necessarily always with the best interest or maybe having guys in their pockets um to be able to get those things done and i'm sure you know on the grand scheme of it all there's a little bit of that everywhere right but for you specifically um, 
how was that as a decision to make, um, you know, and uh, kind of who helped you along with that? And, you know, what, what, what was the support system like um, for you uh, specifically in getting into the political realm? Great question, Darren. It's, it's kind of a two part. We'll pick up the second part because it, it's, it's not necessarily all the way related, so. Sure. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a great question because at that point when I decided to serve in my local city uh, and become a public servant, and I think there's a difference between being a public servant and being a politician, and I've spoke on this in the past. I, I think that a lot of politicians go into public service with the right intentions, and they go in as a public servant, and then at certain points of the process get lost and all of a sudden now they're just voting party lines. And, and and I'm not saying that we're in a world where you don't need teams to win, right? You don't need villages. You, you don't have to pick a side. And obviously with all the money that's involved in government and politics and you know hundreds of millions of dollars to win presidential elections, um, money matters <laughs> and raising money and, and picking the right teams matter. But one of the things that I was most proud of is, you know, I, 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 I was approached by the mayor at the town at the time, Alan Fung, to serve for an open seat. I didn't have to run. Um, and I, I certainly had reservations. I didn't just say yes. I I think I said no maybe three times before the fourth final yes. Um, and I had to talk with my family. I had to talk with my mom, my dad, my wife, and uh, my business partner. Probably uh, he was one that had the most reservations because if you make a, a stance on something, um, it could affect or have rippling effects on whether or not someone wants to support you in business. And, you know, I had to con convince not only him, but myself that I was going to stay true to my character, that I was going to bring both sides together, that it didn't matter um, if I was going in as an independent and had to declare being a Republican because that was one of the contingencies that, that I was given. Um, because right when I left, I went back to being an independent. But one of the things that I'm most proud of in those two and a half terms in local government, not at the high level, was I was able to bring both sides together. And, you know, the amount of work that we got done while I was serving, we're still seeing those effects now with parks being built and schools being redone and Top Golf coming. And, and that was really just uh, taking the same approach that I've taken in business and in life and listening and not uh, voting party lines. And uh, one of the things I'm most proud of uh, was my ability and still to work with a Democrat, work with a Republican, work with an independent. It didn't matter to me. It just mattered about Cranston and it mattered about people and it mattered about the future of the city that I wanna grow my kid up in. And even leaving, you know, I at the time agree with the ethics commission's decision to have to resign if I wanted to pursue the theater. But now further in, as I've, I've learned more and more, I, I, I couldn't uh, agree more because, you know, theater particularly, arts in, in particular, you know, uh, it, it needs to be some type of public-private partnership. And you have to work hand in hand with your cities and your towns and sometimes go for relief because you're trying, it's not about profit, right? It's, you're trying to just sustain arts and keep music and entertainment alive for our future generations. So this that particular project has been one of the hardest but also most rewarding projects of my life to know that now we're entering the 100th year in just a few, for, a few short weeks, I made the right decision. But at one point in that process, you know, Lieutenant Governor became available and my name's getting tossed around in the press. And, you know, you're reading things that from people that have never even met you about you that aren't true and you have to learn how to block noise, uh, you know, it's certainly humbling to be considered, uh, you know, for a position like that. And then, you know, even have a Democratic governor become your friend when you were serving as a moderate Republican. I mean, none of it for me was about Republican or Democrat. It was about change and about progress and understanding that I have, I did, and I still believe I do, have the voice of the people because they know I'm not deep down a politician. They know that I'm listening and creating change and making impact uh, by being consistent. They can look at the track record of the last 20 years of my life. And I'm not, I wasn't running for ego. You know, if I ever decide to go back into that arena and be a mayor of my town or, or potentially run for higher office here locally, 
I would want to apply those same principles um, than what we're seeing at a higher level, you know, and I, I think, uh, you know, it's very difficult for me to speak on who should be the next president or, or you know, who should, uh, that's, that's every family in America to decide, you know, for me though, I do believe that we can make decisions on the towns that we live that make rippling effects on our local communities. It really matters to me to get invested more so than at the president, more so in Cranston on knowing all the candidates that are running and right. getting to know them and building relationships. Because we know if you want to lose 40 pounds, you want to lose 60 pounds, you got to start by losing the first two. If you want to change the world, you got to start by picking up the trash in your local town. You got to start by picking up a paintbrush and painting a bridge. You got to start by showing that you care right there. And, uh, you know, that's where I'm at, man. You know, I, I live in this small little town called Cranston and this small little state called Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, I, I like this ability where we all know each other so we can have real conversations. Right. Right? Even on the outside, I feel like I'm getting more done on the, than I was on the inside because of my ability, again, to talk to both sides and, and hopefully find compromise somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So the second part of my question was to just kind of like, because we I, would, I do a separate podcast with my with my homie, uh, DJ Hire Monkey. Um, and last night we did like an election episode. We went through the ballot um, and, you know, really stressed the importance of like local elections. Um, and so as a, as a, as a, someone who's been in the political realm, I just wanted you to touch on like the importance of voting, even if you don't vote, like I, I said yesterday, even if you don't vote for the top of the ticket, vote for the things that affect you locally, because those are generally the most important things as far as impact, um, when it comes to like your day to day, you know, sure. in Washington, they pass policies, but in, in, in Rhode Island, those policies get administered. And that money gets distributed based on who we elect, you know, on the ground floor. So I just wanted you to maybe quickly touch on like the importance of that for you um, as a as a local politician at one time. Without question, without question, uh, you know, and, and I, I could I, if I'm having a rough day, Daryl, you know, I'll drive around the city uh, that I love and, uh, you know, I'll find myself going to a park bench that uh, Cranston Cares was able to donate at Machinicate Lake and sit on that bench or. I'll view someone else sitting at one of those benches or I'll, I'll go by a basketball court that I know we were able to rehabilitate and watch kids playing. And it'll kind of reshift the mind back into a positive direction. And, uh, you know, I say all that, all that to you because I can see firsthand the rippling effects of positive leadership uh, humbly that I've had, not only in Cranston, but also other leaders around me, because I wasn't able to execute a lot of those ideas by myself. Obviously, they're done with a village. They're done with other people. And I, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I early voted. I, it, my, my voting card, you wouldn't know what party I was in, because it was all over <laughs> the map, right? It was, it was D's, it was all over, I believed. Um, is going in with the right intention and, uh, and, and and who I believe has maintained their character in time serving. And, uh, you know, I, I, you spoke on it earlier. A lot of politicians get a bad rap. Well, I, I know a lot of great public servants and a lot of great people that are making really, really positive impacts here on the state. It's some very, very difficult economic times. I mean, we can all point fingers and say, what's wrong with society, but what are you going to do to change it personally? How are you going to get involved? What committees are you going to join? How are you going to continue to educate yourself to help these leaders we're putting in position? You know, I pray, I pray for a lot of these leaders. How can they keep the, the strength of their mind? How can they keep uh, resilience to withstand what I know happens? There's a lot of pressures in that world where if you vote against your party, uh, you know, some stuff starts to happen that gets weird. You know, I, I've seen folders on many candidates. I've seen black blackmail happen and people get out not only in my hometown, but throughout the state of Rhode Island. And, and uh, you know, it, it's bizarre. It's bizarre, really, uh, what happens on some, it, it, you know, it's about jobs. It's about money. But really, if you get back to the core of it, it's about people and it's about community. And it's about, in my case, Cranston. So Cranston has a lot of great people running. Uh, specifically, uh, I can tell you that I know some of the biggest votes I've made against party lines were able to get in a judge, first judge in Cranston's history of diversity. And, you know, that that judge is now doing rippling effects in the community. You know, and I could go on and on about 
just my my short uh, few years that I've, I, I served here in the city. And uh, again, the only way society and your, your communities improve is people getting back to a table, having real conversations, listening, investing time in the future of our children. And uh, I, I encourage everyone to get out there and vote. Every vote matters. Some of these local elections go to, you know, have to go to the counts at the end because they're so close. So. We, we just had a, a primary in, in Cranston that was the lowest voter turnout, I think, in, in history. And maybe that's partially because of it's a primary. Uh, but, but you know, it's also because I think a lot of people are fed up. You know, you spoke on it earlier. I think a, a lot of people are fed up on the unauthenticity at the national level. I think a lot of people are fed up with uh, the narratives that have been presented to us and the hypocrisies that we've witnessed on a national level. Again, bringing it back to local, that's not the case. I mean, you know, a lot of these people serving are school teachers that are working a second or third job as a city council person or yada, yada. They're real people. You can touch them. You know, I did a right. driving with the governor in a car with my brother Lupe and um, Rodi Foodi. And, you know, we, we could touch the governor. He's a real person. He has feelings, just like you or I. He inherited, we weren't first in every category in here in Rhode Island when he started leading. If I recall, we were last in very many categories. So if he's incrementally yeah. making improvements over time and we're 47th instead of last, well, then, you know, believe it or not, he's making progress. And he inherited, in my opinion, uh, this bridge issue, which is, uh, you know, a very big yeah. topic here in the state. And it's affecting our state. It has to be. It's affecting businesses. It's affecting people's time and commute. And uh, it should be a real kind of conversation accountability has to happen but at the same time you know something that i'm cognizant of is you can't blame the current person for something that was part of them so i know i went all over the place on that answer no, I, uh, listen this is the, the the purpose of the conversations are, are to you know get inside your mind yeah. and uh you know we, we know how a little bit more how ed thinks and how he how you handle you know high stress situations because without these conversations and people knowing that oh you know, it's more like me than I thought he was. You know sure. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or, you know, we have a lot of the same things that, you know, I, I don't have anybody I can talk to, but now this conversation may have opened up. But now we get to the fun part. We're going to do a little bit of rapid fire. I'm going to ask you a question. You can be as brief or as unbrief as you feel like you need to. Um, but do you have a, a, a favorite quote that you reference back? You know, quote. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a couple, um, but I, I will tell you a book that changed my life uh, called The Four Agreements. I'm not sure if you've read that one. I've read it a couple but times. But I think it's the starter pack of, of, you know, getting right here. And if you can live your life by uh, always doing your best, uh, not making assumptions, don't make assumptions. You know, we always uh, assume someone else's, don't make assumptions. Uh, you know, be impeccable to your word. Uh, be impeccable to your word uh, means a lot of things to me. Uh, you know, you grow up, uh, fake it till you make it, or, you know, you think you got to tell a story. You know, I, the older I get, the more, more and more impeccable to my word I become. I, I'm very authentic with uh, the words that come out of my mouth, how I feel, and I'm not, I'm not afraid to change my word. You know, be impeccable. Well, this is what I believe, but someone just presented an alternative thought that made me change my my word. And, and the hardest chapter for me. Uh, the hardest, uh, you know, I'm using, utilizing it as a quote, but it's an entire chapter is uh, don't take it personal, you know, and, and for me that that chapter, I could I could feel a certain way about something and, you know, I, I might believe something, but then someone else doesn't want to do it or, you know, someone might be beeping the car and I want to I want to respond. I want to have right rage, but they might have just lost their mother, you know, and for me, I, I think uh, not, not taking it personal is something that I work on daily. And uh, I, I work on all those agreements daily, but um, yeah, they, and I know this is rapid fire, so I don't want to answer too fast. Uh, it's it's cool, but you answered two questions at the same time. Uh, all right. My next question was going to be if you had a book recommendation. Um, I, I too mm -hmm. have read the Four Agreements, and I realized that I've been living the Four Agreements. Amen. Amen. My, like most of my life, and I just didn't know that there was a book that described it. Um, yeah, yeah. Me too. And if, if I can drop another one, uh, um, yeah, absolutely. I'm reading a great book right now. Um, by David Goggins. I don't know if you've read that one. It's a mindset book on, uh, you know, him just kind of uh, how he grew up and his uh, autobiography. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can't hurt us. I believe his name. Can't hurt. Yep. I um, actually listened to the audio book. He does the audio version. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's like little skits in between things like that. Very good. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Great, another great book that I'm I'm, I'm not done with. Um, I'm on page seventy four. Uh, but I'm that's the one I'm reading right now. Ten pages a week, uh, a day. I'm is I'm trying to get to the finish line on that one. But yeah, I, I like reading a lot uh, as I get older because I think that uh, if we want to have opinions on things, we have to be versed on subject matter. Absolutely. Right? So absolutely. And that, uh, David Goggins is a he's an animal. But Peace. you know when you when you dig down into his in the book like you're that's an exciting read I'm excited for you to read that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving it so far. You know, Love it's a it was a it was a great listen for me. I do a lot of my books on audio now because I'm outside uh, with the postal service most of the day, so I get in a lot of a lot of audio books and I did that one audio audio way. And uh, man, yeah, you're gonna enjoy it. Is what that's I said. Stuff, I, won't, I won't spoil it for you, but you're gonna that's enjoy stuff. it. Um, Best advice that you have for you know up and coming uh, folks in the in the that want to get into the entrepreneurial business, uh, what would be your advice to them? Uh, entrepreneurship is the hardest profession, in my opinion, in the world. You know, and uh, resilience is 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 everything. Uh, your ability to keep believing in hard times is everything uh, surrounding yourself with like-minded positive and realistic thinkers who are stronger than you in so many different areas finding mentors find you know a lot of this younger generation in my opinion um, they're looking for more instant gratification instant money for time spent and in one regard that's not a, a bad thing you know they're making money faster than any generation before us and it's there's a different way to make money obviously you can make money doing this and streaming and, and youtube and and uh, all sorts of different ways but at the same time uh it doesn't happen overnight you know at least uh in my journey it's 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 been con constant progression and every single time where it got really dark whether it be COVID or 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 uh, you know, battle in the theater when I couldn't understand why the city was walking away from $8 million for free and, uh, you know, whatever it may be. I think going back to those same core principles, those same four agreements, those same things that we learn as in a play box when we're kids or rewatching my child with his balloon and how happy he is, it's like you, you really, really have to be happy with yourself before you can be happy with others. Don't give up. Uh, and uh, you know, just just keep going. You know, if, if if I could give myself advice, that 16 year old kid, it's like the next day always comes. So it's like fear or the thoughts that we allow into our head, uh, we can't let overtake the vision that God or whatever you believe presented. Um, if you believed you could do it in the beginning, God knows it's going to get hard. You just uh, you got to power through it. You got to find a way to find that balance of your lifestyle where it's not just work, 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 where it's work, community, family, hobby, learning, reading, all these balances of soul. Uh, because like we touched on this earlier, you could you could die tomorrow, you know. So like if I had a million dollars, then what does it matter, you know? Unless I'm doing the daily work, if I'm if I'm getting out of bed. If I'm, I'm setting my time with intention, keep going. Word. Um, we know that you, you said you mentioned that you play hockey. I also know that you're a golfer. Uh, which one has the, which one, which one is, is your favorite? Are you a hockey guy or do you consider yourself a golfer? Ooh. Um, I was competitive as a kid uh, in every sport I played. Uh, I was, I was super competitive in hockey. And uh, golf has opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunity for me, specifically in business. At this point in my life, I don't consider myself a competitive golfer. I just enjoy the conversation of the people I'm playing with. Uh, one of my favorite golfing partners uh, now is a gentleman by the name, an artist named Arthur Ko, And uh, I just like the conversations we have. So, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's more therapeutic, the game of golf versus trying to go out and win a golf tournament or, you know, play at a competitive level like I did when I was a kid. Hockey, on the other hand, uh, there were so many lessons in hockey that I was learning without even realizing them at a very early age. I can go back to uh, early all-star team where the team was already picked and I was one of the last ones on the ice. And I just put my head down and instead of giving up, I, I really, really worked and grinded and, and 
kept putting the effort in. I was the last kid picked on that team. It's called the Rhode Island Saints. And eventually went on travel teams and, and got to know these families and had rippling effects on networks later on in life. And, and, you know, your ability to get the puck out of the corner, to outwork people. I'm not the tallest guy on earth. I don't have the most athletic body, but I was fast. And I was the first one in practice. I was the last one off practice. I, I put the work in. And, you know, one thing I realized about hockey, which eventually led me to want to get good grades and go to Bryant and, you know, continue playing at a higher level is um, it's, it's all what you put into anything. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I was, a, uh, in my opinion, I was a really good teammate. And eventually that was probably one of my first starts in leadership when you're a captain and going into things. But uh, hockey is a great sport. Uh, as far as Maverick goes, I, I want him to try anything and everything. Uh, I don't want to mold him into what I loved. I want him to find what he loves and what he can learn through in each each journey of his process that will eventually make him a better man one day like it did me. Is he already on skates? Soon. I think uh, <laughs> this year is the year it happens, yeah. Nice. Um, as someone who can't ice skate, uh, you know, yeah, it's always cool to see, like, little little kids out there on on skates. <laughs> He does do a cameo uh, in our recent movie. He's, he's at the end of the movie, which was really uh, cool for me. And Tom oh, gave a shot, and it was on the ice. And uh, I loved uh, how much he loved the energy of the rink. So I'm, I'm hopeful. But he also likes throwing that basketball, which is same season. So uh, whatever he wants to do, I'll be supportive as a dad. And now for the, the most important question of the day, Mr. Brady. Um, strawberry Pop-Tarts or – Cinnamon sugar pop tarts. Ooh, good question. Uh, one thing I realized on my recent seventy-five semi-hard is uh, cinnamon has this way of cinnamon gum. Anything I'm chewing, of reducing my appetite. And I certainly love food. I think Rhode Island has some of the best food on earth. And uh, strawberry is is a, is a delicious flavor. But cinnamon, I think I got to go with. Uh, because it helps reduce my cravings and keep me going on this uh, lifestyle change of positive health. So, yeah, I gave you a serious answer on a funny question. <laughs> it's all good, man. Um, yeah. And I appreciate you taking the time to join me today. And have a conversation. Me, um, you know, if there's anything you need to self-promote or promote right now is your opportunity, how folks can get in touch with you. Um, obviously, the Thirsty Beavers are out there. Um, but is there anything that you want to add? No, they can reach out to me on Instagram. Um, you know, I'm very responsive. Uh, I love hearing people's stories, people's journeys, meeting new people. Um, I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm here to continue to hopefully pot, be part of the positive change, be vulnerable, be honest. Uh, I'm imperfect like everybody else. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, let's all continue to try to have real conversations and rise with the village. Uh, I, I really appreciate you have me today and, and the time that you spent asking me and, uh, you know, watching you do this and continue to evolve yourself. So, uh, no, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And, uh, yeah, just, just, just keep going, everybody. Just keep going. This Word. is a long time. So just keep going. And that is going to do it for another episode of inside the mind of this week or this episode. We had the incomparable Ed Brady on the show, guys, make sure you hit that like and subscribe on the YouTube channel. And uh, we'll check y'all on the next episode.